Okay, let's welcome Martin Kraft. He will talk about recursive uh, inventory management, and this will be a, a subject that is interesting to all of us who do uh, system automation. So, welcome, Martin. Hello. Is this uh, good with the microphone? Excellent. Um, yeah, I'm here to talk to you about recursive inventory management, and I don't assume that everybody of you knows what I mean with that just from the title. As a matter of fact, maybe I can say up front before I go into my slides that the name recursive in this is um, born out of a very, very long night in Switzerland, actually. Um, and I should have chosen a better name, but I guess it's stuck. So uh, whenever you see recursive in the uh, co following couple of slides, you can think of hierarchical if you want. Back then, when I was implementing it, I did it recursively. So that's why I call it recursive but we shouldn't expose too much of the internal implementation designs, right? Anyway, I'm going to be talking about configuration management, and uh, because that is also a name that was used for some time uh, for what is known now as version control, um, I specifically want to say that this is about system administration. So if you hear from version control, then actually that's not the right place. Um, configuration management. As I understand it, as most of you will understand it, I'm sorry, Thomas, that um, Phi is not on there, um, is something to do with one of these or some other tools. You will have probably seen, possibly used, some of these tools at some point in time. They are listed here in somewhat order of increasing or decreasing age. Um, so CF Engine predates it pretty much all, and one of the latest newcomers has been Ansible and Salt. Um, and I'm actually going to not be talking about CF Engine, B, C, F, G, 2, and Chef, um, but only about Puppet Salt and Ansible, and actually not even about those, but I can tell you that what I'm about to tell you works with those three products. When I talk about configuration management, I also mean system automation. I mean that uh, my assumption is that every single system administrator is lazy, or if they are not, they should be. Um, you should be able to do something once and not have to repeat the same task all the time. As a matter of fact, if you did it the second time, then you've done something wrong. That is sort of the mantra of uh, system administration. And over the last couple of years, I have noticed that there's a very strong divide. Well, maybe it's not that strong, but it's certainly a divide into two separate approaches to system um, configuration management or automation. The latest hype has, of course, been the cloud. And uh, we see that this conference is already very cloud-centric uh, um, in some ways. A lot of the talks are about cloud, so obviously I had to put that onto my slides. Otherwise, it would be completely off topic. But uh, there is also, and I beg you all not to forget, the sort of classical approach to system administration. If I identify two approaches, I better go ahead and uh, sort of like separate them for you because maybe I'm the only one that perceives it that way, and so I just kind of just want to use the opportunity to give you an idea of what I mean. The cloud is sort of what, what exists when uh, you have buzzwords that could range from unprecedented ease of system optimization to orchestration. Of course, cloud is all about scalability. Um, and because you might have, I heard an example yesterday, used, uh, you might know that your television ad is about to go live, so you need to be able to spawn very quickly, ad hoc provision very quickly, a thousand new nodes. Uh, the one thing that you know about all these nodes is that they're going to be homogeneous. They're all going to be exactly the same, more or less, right? But they are all web servers that are just designed to handle the requests by your potential customers and generate you money. System administration, classical system administration, um, is a lot older than this concept of the cloud. And system administrators are, as you all know, um, those grumpy people that are running around in the university building. Or actually, they're never running around, right? They enter early in the morning or leave early in the whatever. Um, you never see them. And when you go approach them, you get a BOFH excuse, usually, right, when, uh, when the system doesn't work. But fundamentally, um, what these system administrators are doing are they are maintaining systems that have some sort of longevity. So these systems are installed at one point in time and ideally run for a very long time until the hardware breaks, at which point you try to move that exact same system because you don't want to reconfigure your LDAP and mail server at this point after the hardware crash. Um, you just want to have the same system up. 
So you're dealing with longevity across heterogeneous systems. You have your mail servers, you have your web servers, you have your computation cluster, you have whatever. You know, you know it better than I do in your use cases. The real difference between the cloud provisioning and the classical system administration is the following. We use, the classical system administrators use themed host names, whereas cloud provisioners use www001 through 999. So uh, a little bit of my mission today is to bring back the themed host names. I just put that in there. Laziness, I already uh, mentioned, and uh, I did have unprecedented ease on the last slide. Obviously, if you want to spawn a thousand systems and you pay by the minute, then uh, it should be really easy and quick to do. Laziness is somewhat different from that. Laziness is you don't have a thousand systems, you have 10, but they give you uh, nightmares or wake you up at night or actually cause you to stop your vacation early. And all of that would be much easier if you could just lazily press a button on your smartphone and like from the Caribbean islands have it all be fixed. I'm not promising that that's gonna work. <laughs> and there's also um, the concept of orchestration and classical system administration. I'm just mentioning that here because I, you know, I don't want to rule out that we don't orchestrate. Um, if you have a Nagios installation or Munin or even Postfix with client certificates, uh, you need to know about the other nodes on one hold, node. So in some ways you would like to make sure that the mail server will accept mail sent with a certain client certificate before you tell that client to send mail with that client certificate. Obviously, if it's five minutes plus or minus and some things don't work, that's okay for the use case. I guess you can do something against that if you want, but we also do orchestrate, we as in the classical system administrators. So, what I'm going to be talking about today, it comes very strongly, as you may have noticed from my speaking, from the perspective of the classical system administrator. But it will, potentially, if I do a good job or if you take the time to look at it, suit your cloud needs as well. So it is not something that is exclusive to classical system administration. It might actually be something that revolutionizes the way you think about and uh, do system administration on your cloud. I think one of the core differences between these configuration management systems that I've introduced, Puppet and Ansible and Salt, um, which also relates to the distinction between the classical system administrator and the cloud provisioner. I should invade, invade actually. Um, the cloud provisioner is, in my opinion, the one that thinks about system autom autom automation in a way of targeting configuration at nodes. Whereas I think that the classical system administrator thinks about classifying a specific host. Now, the distinction between those two is not at all clear cut. And I'm really hoping for your patience here and for your understanding that you will just let me get by with this because I'm not willing to answer questions about terminology. But let me give you examples of what I mean. When you do cloud provisioning with a tool such as Salt and Ansible, these are the latest newcomers to the game and they are very much targeted at the cloud, um, whereas Puppet sort of like existed before the cloud came and then tried to um, implement cloud-like behavior or features into its uh, feature set. Um, when, you, when you come at the cloud provisioning problem from these uh, tools' perspectives, then what you're doing is you're saying, my mail servers are expected to work such and such have port 25 open on their firewalls, for instance. And then you say, this should be applied. And obviously I have my systems or cloud somewhere. I should have made that a cloud, damn it. Um, you, have, you have your machine somewhere out there. And then you say, um, I, I will target the configuration that I expect from my mail servers to the following IPv4 network. I will target my Debian-specific configuration to all of the nodes that export the fact I am Debian or has some sort of Debian-related fact. Um, fact, just very quickly, is something that is generally generated on the node and then exported back to the system so that you have some knowledge about what the node is like, which system is it running, which, which version, what's the host name, what's the SSL certificate fingerprint, et cetera. These are all facts that are exported to the central location and used there. And what we're doing here is that we're actually relying on these facts um, to target behavior at nodes 
Or for instance, if your domain name ends in zurich.corporation, then you might, be, you, might, you might have all of the um, configuration that is specific to being hosted in Zurich at these nodes that fulfill these criteria. Now, I think that is backwards. Maybe that's because I'm limited to my classical system administration thinking, but imagine these questions. What classes does a specific node belong to? Which behaviors does a specific node, or is an ex a specific node expected to have? And you can only answer that by looking at all of the data generated, your entire inventory, and then walking it back. So it's, it's kind of inefficient. On the other hand, of course, you will see that the other questions that you can easily ask, answer with the system of targeting nodes are not as trivially answered with reclasses. So it's really just the opposite perspective of going at it. Um, but another thing that I find very disturbing is that the behavior is actually dependent on data on the host. And while I can see a lot of benefit in that, because you do want to have infrastructure of sorts, I still think about system administration as partially being about keeping an inventory of all the stuff that you have and sort of centrally defining the behaviors that you want from your systems and then ma making sure that the software forces those on the systems rather than asking the systems first whether this is what they want. It, I think it gives you much less um, pr space for errors if you can look at a central location and know that when this is enacted, all of the nodes are going to be the same rather than having to worry about data that is exported by one of these nodes. So how I think about it, and this is not going to come as a surprise and, uh, um, to many of you, and uh, this is also probably not even that different from what I just showed with targeting. As I said, the, the difference is, is not clear cut. What I, what I think about is that when I have a node that's called blue.example.org, I want to say this node has a certain number of classes. This node has this behavior rather than saying this behavior should be targeted at this node. So I say that this node belongs to the classes mail server, NTP client, for instance, and hosted at Zurich. And this is very much uh, CF Engine uh, inspired. That's what the first one did, the first uh, configuration management system that I know did, and I got to uh, know about it through Phi, actually, and I really liked the idea, and it just stuck. I couldn't get rid of it anymore. Um, this is, this is very much like definition of behavior and controlling the software, the configuration management software that you're dealing with. And I'm not actually going to go into that at all today. So no puppet, no salt, no Ansible specifics here. Um, but one of the problems that comes with all of these systems is where do I keep my data? Where do I specify the values for the parameters that these systems expose? Because they are not all equal. They are, as I showed earlier, part of a mostly heterogeneous environment. I might go ahead and say that my NTP clients should all just benefit from pool.ntp.org and specify the server to be that. But then, for some reason, I mean, ideally, uh, that's a distributed system, right? I might want to say that actually when the server is in Zurich, it should use a different value. In this case, only the servers that are in Zurich use a different value. All the others fall back to the default. That's not rocket science. Same example here. We also have a second node called white, which is hosted in Munich. Now, let's look at Puppet. Let's look at how we do this approach with Puppet. I'm sorry that I just noticed that the NTP server is actually not zur.de.pool.ntp.org, but uh, red at my own infrastructure. I hope you will forgive me for this. Um, my point here is that I want to tell Puppet that the server at Blue should be using an NTP, should be an NTP client. That is why I include the, uh, the NTP class here, or the module, which provides this functionality, but that it should actually not fall back to the default, but should use red.example.org as the NTP server. Now, if you have five systems, that's fine. If you have 50, it's probably still fine if you are not quite sold by that concept of laziness that I earlier introduced. But if you have a couple of hundred servers, then this is not going to be okay anymore because suddenly you will find yourself with a 
site description that has a lot of these stanzas, and they are just all going to be the same. So in Puppet, you can actually factor out some of these behaviors into something that is not really a node, but sort of an include, if you want to think about it like that. Um, also, programming programmers will uh, understand what is meant here by inherit. Um, now, in the common nodes, all nodes that inherit from this node definition, there is a default set um, for the NTP server, and it includes the NTP class. And just by the mere fact of inheritance, blue.example.org now also includes an NTP client configured to use that server. But blue.example.org is in Zurich, and we want to be using the Swiss specific. They run better, you know? So I go in, look, the NTP server for blue should be red, right? <laughs> no, anger. <laughs> that does not work. This, unfortunately, does not work in Puppet. In addition, there are multiple inheritance. So what, what I mean with multiple inheritance, the programmers might run away now. Um, what I mean with multiple inheritance is that obviously you're not just, not all of your hosts in Zurich are also NTP clients, ideally, and you don't want to be creating a class for every single combination of potential parents that you have. Um, so it's really nice to be able to multiply inherit from, from different behaviors, and Puppet unfortunately doesn't do that. In fact, Puppet actually says in their docs specifically that you should not use inheritance. So what I just showed you, this, what, what seems sensible to many of us to factor out common behavior rather than having it all in one place, multiply, multiply it a thousand times, Puppet actually discourages this in the documentation. Now, I'm not trying to take a stab at Puppet here. Um, there is, the, Puppet w was one of the very first tools to actually say, if you want something more complicated than uh, the simple node definitions, then use this functionality that we have over here. Um, it does make what I just showed in terms of the overriding the NTP server, it does make parameterization unnecessarily difficult simply because Puppet only ever knows one instance of the variable NTP server. And unless you want to go into scoping nightmare, uh, you are basically stuck with re-implementing a lot of the data or multiplying a lot of the data and generating a lot of redundancy, which, as we all know, is going to bite you at some point in time. So let me, before I go on, uh, let me go a little bit into the, uh, what I consider to be system optimization principles and a bridged version because I don't want to have any questions about what I'm le leaving out and uh, suggestions that this list is incomplete. I know it is. These are the important things for me. I want to be centrally in control of something and I want my data to be versioned with versioning control system of your choice. I need to have parameterization. I need to be able to say that NTP clients, that's a very simple example, right? But think of postfix. It's like it comes with 500 parameter value configuration possibilities, and some of those are actually sensible to parameterize because they are going to differ between the code. And uh, I have seen too many installations of Puppet where you actually have in the module code, in the one that is responsible for installing your NTP server or postfix, special casing based on the host name. And that just hurts. Not right there because it makes it work, but at the next upgrade or when something changes and suddenly you have all this redundancy in the code that is going to come back and bite you. I think that system administration should be about no redundancy. Do it once, do it in one place only, and be able to always find that place where you did it very easily without thinking too much about it at 3 o'clock in the morning after being woken. Um, I think that this idea of using information from the node, such as the IP address or the free memory or the SSL fingerprint, is actually very good. But I don't think that it ever should be used to um, steer the behavior that is going to be applied to a node. Which is very difficult to say, because obviously I want to describe my infrastructure independent of having to know um, which one is a Fedora server and which one is a Debian server. And, uh, if I, you know, if I need to kind of ask those systems, that, that is at least the fundamental motivation between, behind this, uh, this functionality. But what I'm about to show you 
um, is a system by which you actually take it away from Puppet. You don't say, Puppet, you know how to deal um, with all the different distributions. I just have to tell you to install a package and you'll do the right thing. My approach is to, to say, I know that this host is a Debian node and I'm going to treat it as such. And if that ever changes, <laughs> I think I have a different problem. So reclass, as I said, a misnomer of sorts. You can think about it in terms of hierarchy, but the name Hira has uh, been taken up before I realized that I misnamed mine. Um, it stands for recursive external node classifier. External node classifier is a term that comes from those configuration management softwares and it basically just means instead of requiring you to specify your infrastructure in node groups or in uh, node stanzas as I've just shown in Puppet, um, you have an external data source. And classifier, well, I try to um, make a statement about my use of classes in this. Um, the CMS uses reclass by asking it questions such as, what applications, what modules should be applied? What applications should a role have? How does this node differ from all the other nodes that have the same application, which is parameters? And which nodes belong to a group? Because essentially I want to be talking to groups of nodes and not just individual nodes and not always only to all of them at once. For the system administrator, um, it will obviously, as all of these tools um, do, allow you to deploy and manage site-wide configuration changes. It will allow you to say things like upgrade all the nodes that are tagged with Sable, update the message of the day in Zurich because of a power outage and fetch logs from all of the hosts tagged mail server because the BND or whoever secret service has actually knocked on your door. Um, important for you to realize before I dive into the details of reclass is that reclass just assembles and provides the data. It doesn't do any changes. It doesn't, your hosts don't even know about it. It is actually just one abstraction layer on top of all the configuration management systems. I'll skip that. And it is a single data source, which means that if you use it with one system, you can use it with other th systems. There are adapters that interface between these different systems and reclass. For instance, mode of invocation and output, basically it's an API definition of sorts, system administrator specific API definition by which I mean um, we call programs and then parse output. The adapters that are provided, Puppet, which is actually not yet provided, um, but I'll get into that in a second, Salt and Ansible, as I said earlier. So if you're a user of any of these and you think that you might want to use a different one, this is where uh, the slide about uh, remote execution and configuration comes on. Um, for instance, Salt and Ansible, they work very well together. I mean, Ansible is very great at remote execution and is not so great at configuration management, whereas Salt is not so great at external execution um, and, or remote execution and somewhat better <laughs> at, at uh, configuration management. The important point is you can use both of them and you keep all of your relevant inventory data in reclass. And those tools just get the data out of reclass and do what you ask them to do. So Puppet, why is it not actually in Puppet? It was originally written for Puppet because Puppet didn't do what I wanted. And then I, Puppet really didn't do what I wanted and I rage quit Puppet and I removed it. That was the best thing ever. Tell the new configuration management system to just purge Puppet. It's the first thing you do. Get rid of your predecessor. It's a good feeling. All these Ruby packages. Um, so I rewrote Reclass since I ditched Puppet and uh, I wrote it for Ansible and Salt, which is what I'm using at the moment and I could really not be bothered to re-implement it. Now, to all the Puppet users who are wanting to use reclass who are interested by this. Um, there are a couple, I'm not trying to scare you away, there are a couple of ways to do it. Either you can sit down, I'm sure you'll have it done in an hour, or you buy me a beer and I'll do it for you. It's trivial. Salt, who of you uses salt? That's almost a representative sample. Um, it provides top and pillar data for salt. It has been actually integrated as a salt, not reclass itself, but the adapter for reclass has been integrated in salt since server 16, which is not yet in Debian. It is in unstable, but not in backports or stable. Uh, node groups, if you're interested in, if you, if you are, uh, would like to 
completely get rid of the top data in salt, then we need node groups, and uh, so ask me if you want to help here. Ansible, who of you uses Ansible? That's an equally big representative sample size. Um, it provides inventory and node information. It is actually implemented as an external script, unfortunately. It does not support this really new feature of batched calls, um, but enough of this boring stuff, right? I think that parameterization to system administration is key. If you manage to somehow remove all of the salient bits of information that differ between your nodes in your infrastructure and factor them out, keep them in reclass, ideally, then you're going to have a much easier time switching hosts around or doing this and that or switching configuration management systems around because all your data is independent of that. Of course, we should only do the sensible approach. Um, don't special case, please. Um, reclass even allows you to keep your parameters modular so that you don't have to, in reclass, duplicate information and ideally non-redundantly define your data in one location. So let's look at uh, what it's like. YAML is probably known to everyone here, and if not, then I trust that you will immediately understand this. Um, here's the definition, uh, abridged definition of blue, which you've already met. Um, it is a postfix node, so it has an application of postfix defined, and it is an NTP client, and it has a server defined, which is the canonical default server. What this means is that it, it's independent. Uh, what you see here is independent from what your configuration management system ends up doing. Applications might be called modules. They might be called states in SALT, for instance, or they might be called, uh, I forget what it's called in Ansible. It doesn't matter. It, but you can understand that this is actually going to translate into a host that has postfix installed and a host that has the NTP client config installed and configured to be um, this value here. But this is not recursive. What we have in reclass is basically two directories. We have uh, YAML files for nodes in this directory, and then also YAML files defining classes in another directory. And the recursive part is that nodes and classes may specify other classes to inherit from. As many as you want. You can think of these classes as tags. I very often do because you might want to address all your systems that have postfix installed. So just simply talk to all the nodes in the class postfix. And it does smart deep merging on return from a recursive descent walk. I had to show off a little bit that I'm a computer science student here. Um, by which I mean that obviously there's going to be some data replacements going on. And uh, this is implemented in Python and also YAML has a merging feature. But when you have a set of um, values defined on one host and the set of values on another host, and they all happen to be kept inside a dictionary, inside of a hash, then obviously you don't want to just replace the existing hash with a new hash and forget all of your existing information, but you want to merge the two dictionaries. And the same exists for lists and the same exists for some special cases of scalars. Yeah. What about order for of the text? Very good question. I have pre slides prepared for that. <laughs> but let me first uh, show how the next step would be. So here's blue, and uh, we have a class down there called common, and uh, we now have NTP defined for all nodes, so it's in the common class. And other than that, I changed the name. Oh, yeah, it's now classes mail server, not applications postfix anymore. But I'm sure you can see the direct relation between what I just showed and what this is now. And obviously, what you would expect, this is the value that gets installed as the NTP client on the blue host. Um, in general, and this is a very, very important um, baseline assumption that you can rely on in reclass, but that you also need to understand, um, when you have something that is more specific, that, uh, that talks about less nodes, then it overrides the data that you specify in a more speci uh, less specific case for instance, all your Debian at stable nodes will be able to override the parameters that were defined in the Debian common class. I hope that makes sense. So in this case, now to get to your question um, about the ordering, um, we have a new class here hosted at Zurich, and it defines the NTP client or server to be the Swiss-specific one. 
Um, but we also know that common, this class up here, already includes the NTP server and already defines a default. And as a matter of fact, we might have multiple of those. Um, but through this hosted at Zurich, simply because the class appears later in this list, it gets to override it. There is a well-defined order, even if you don't want to worry too much about this. Because all you have to do, for instance here, let's change to a different program. Let's say uh, that in general, I want my SSH servers to have no root login allowed. What about a backup client? That needs to allow root login. Or you can find other solutions for it, sure. But what, this is one of the ways to do it. So now you define a class backup client and you set in it, you override in it, permit root login with a, without password. And because the backup client comes after the SSH server, expected behavior. But this might not be enough for you. So all you have to do now is that if my backup client actually relies on SSH for transfer, then depend on the class, on the class for SSH server, which will now cause um, when, when the backup client is hit to walk through the data structure and do everything that is necessary, including the merging for the SSH server, unless it has already done that. Right? In this case, it would just simply say, I've already seen the SSH server. I don't need to do it again. It would actually be bad if I did it again, right? No, it's only on first occurrence. And then there's also um, something called parameter interpolation. And that actually wrecked my brain and really made me question whether I am a CS student. Um, because inside these, this entire data structure that is being created when you merge reclass data um, up the tree, or down the tree, should I say, um, you now can, in reclass, reference any other key. So in this case, for instance, I might want to have a message that is a reference to Floyd in my message of the day. And then in Diamond, um, one of the hosts in my infrastructure, I simply uh, include a little message. And that gets automatically merged as well. And this is, looks a little bit trivial. A lot of the other configuration management systems do it themselves already. But then it's either single pass. So if you have two references, then you get stuck with, a, with another reference. Or it converts everything to strings, which is not necessarily something that you want. You might want to have a list after all. So future work, I'm almost at the end of this. Um, I need to package reclass. I feel really stupid. I come to DebConf to give a talk about reclass, and it's not actually in the archive. But that should not be a problem. It's a Python module, and you can very easily pull it from Git at the moment and uh, install it with easy install. But I, I'll, I'll try to work on the packaging this week as well. Um, I was thinking, and also during DebConf, you could actually integrate this with uh, preceding and uh, DI so that you could provide your data even before installation and then have the same data reused later on when you are done with installation and you pass over to configuration management. Um, in terms of cloud, uh, you, if, you have your name ser uh, if you have your servers named www001 through 999, you don't really want to create a 1,000 identical YAML files that all inherit from the same class. So I'm thinking there should be some sort of policy classification where you can say that all of the nodes that um, basically wildcards on, on the node name. <laughs> that should be implemented. Membership lists, that is the concept of um, um, postfix and client certificates, what I mentioned earlier, or that you want your Nagios clients to be also monitored by the Nagios server. Um, a lot of the configuration management systems address that by having some sort of wacky uh, communication between nodes or essential data collection uh, called uh, in Puppet, for instance, store configs, um, which I think does not belong there. Even though I agree it is nice to think about that Nagios only starting to monitor a certain node as soon as that node has actually started the client package. Um, yeah, sure. But if, if 15 minutes later, d through the when the next time the configuration management system runs, I will know that now definitely all of my nodes are in the same state, I can just statically tell um, the Nagios server about all of the clients. But obviously, I don't want to have any um, redundancy in the data set. So somehow, Reclass needs to figure out membership lists of classes and be able to pass them on as parameters. Haven't figured that out yet. Other data sources, potentially in terms of performance, YAML files could become a problem. They are, after all, opened and read and closed for every single run of reclass at the moment. Um, you could put this into a database. There's actually already a plugin infrastructure in place. Better unit testing without any philosophical debates. And your idea here, if you're interested by what I just said and you have some uh, usage ideas, then I'd be very, very glad to hear them. And 
with that, I end my talk and thank you for the attention and I'm open to questions. Can you move back, uh, I think, three slices? There was where, where you said there's a parameter and then, yeah, this one. Um, down there, if you add classes SSH server, is it important that classes is written after parameters? No. YAML uh, is, is basically very compatible with Python and all this causes. Uh, this is going to be read into a Python dict, and the dict is unordered anyway, so it doesn't matter. So, so it, it's, it's, it's defined that the interpretation of this syntax is that even if the parameter is without password and then the class says SSH client, which has, um, has a higher priority, which you defined in classes SSH server or in backup client? This is it's a very good question because it allows me to also address one more time this distinction between targeting hosts and classifying them. Um, with the targeting hosts approach, you would now say, what's the parameter that all of my web servers should get? And with reclass, or the way that I like to think about things, I start here. I say, I have blue right now in, in my screen, and I want to configure that. And so I then start a recursive walk of the tree. So in this case, I load the SSH server class, and then continue to do my work here. And it merges the, this value no into my tree, and then it comes back. And then I go to backup client, and backup client then merges this scalar over this scalar so that at the end, when I come back to my class, I, I now have the without path password um, set. If those two were re reversed, if SSH server was after backup client because you just you know quickly set up the host and you then went out to dinner or something like that, um, then what would happen is backup client would be loaded. It would actually set Sorry, no, it would actually see there are classes, so then it would go into SSH server. It would then read this, write no into the tree, and then come back to backup client and overwrite the no with without password before it then returns to blue.example.org. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure if I really understand. Seems to be a bit complicated. It be, 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 be because it, it can be a very big tree. This is, a, this is a very classic example of where a uh, diagram would have been a better slide than just code. Um, on the other hand, what you just said, this could be a very big tree that made me stop the idea from drawing a diagram because it was yeah. not going to be very informative. Um, I, I suppose I can either try to explain it again or let, just let it sink in. Ask me if you still have problems because I'm fairly sure that everybody who has dealt with recursion at some point in time or who understands what it means to even walk the directory tree on your Unix system recursively, for instance, using find, will immediately understand what this means. Um, when, what I would propose, uh, I think um, if I have a very big configuration with a lot of, uh, yeah, with a big tree or a very deep tree, it would be very nice to have some debug support so I can say, oh, uh, which paths are walked through the tree for a certain client uh, yeah, that would be nice. So I have this to-do list in reclass, and debugging is number four. It, uh, yeah, it would have really helped this, uh, especially the parameter interpolation to implement that correctly because it requires you to do a topological sort of all the dependencies between parameters. Um, that <laughs> really kind of would have been much better if I had debugging done first. Um, but it is very simple in the end, and if you look at the code, it is actually very simple. Um, and once you understand the, the general concept, once you understand what actually happens when you walk a tree, the important, I guess the only important thing here that, that is a little bit different from walking a tree is that what you're doing um, is you're doing the action at the end when you come back up. So it's tail recursion and uh, gosh, I'm sorry, I'm failing at this. It's just too slow. Um, tail recursion means that basically you, d you don't just add to your list when you find a new directory and you, you enumerate the lists, but uh, in terms of Unix file system, imagine you had a symlink somewhere under A um, to a, tr a tree that is somewhere under, under Z. And uh, now when you basically f f walk the entire file system, you will see the contents of the tree referenced by the symlink first, even though it only appears in Z. 
And what, what then is the important part is that you um, store what you've already seen and that you go all the way to the leaf and then you do the operations when you come back. And that's when the merging happens and that's when this uh, um, specifics of um, having more specific uh, data override less specific data comes in. That's how it's implemented. Further questions? I'm happy to, to t walk you through examples and everything. Uh, maybe you already answered in the last slide, but I was distracted. Do, do you plan I to do you plan to uh, to add possibility to use an external node classifier to to a class? I mean, to be able to extract from a database uh, uh, the set of nodes uh, with uh, some properties, which will allow to uh, to do most of the classify. But we 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 will still be uh, it will still be possible to uh, override. Uh, M most of the things uh, with the class. I mean, I'm I have sure already I have a, 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 an external node classifier. This is, this is an external node classifier. So I don't understand. Is your question about can this coexist with another external node classifier or reuse the data from another external node yes. classifier? Um, that is something that I recently thought about how to do. Um, it's kind of difficult because, I mean, unless I want to implement an adapter here for cobbler or whatever you have, right? Um, into reclass, I'd really rather have you configure Cobbler with Salt or with Ansible or Puppet, and then let me get at those data once they are already pulled, because I, I don't think reclass needs to get any more complicated. On the other hand, there are, there's a plugin infrastructure for storage, and this YAML FS, which I showed you, which is the nodes and classes, YAML files, and so on, you can actually, it's two functions that you have to write you can override that and put it into a database or XML RPC to your Cobbler server. I think that should be possible, but uh, I, I don't really want to put this into reclass proper at this moment, but what I do want to do is figure out how to get at the data that your configuration management system has already collected, which includes things like the SSL fingerprints or um, the free memory, all the facts that I was talking about. At the moment, you can't use them in reclass. You have to use that in templates. Later, you have to combine the values, and ideally, you know, it'd be nice if, if you have all the data actually available in one place. Okay. Are there more questions? And there's one. <laughs> yeah, is it on? Yeah. How do you handle? Um, well. I was going to ask, but I think I figured it out. Um, you know, in your Blue example, uh, say you don't care that Blue itself is an SSH server, so you go down the tree, backup client, and that pulls in the SSH server, and then you know, so you know that permit root login was overridden in backup client, so that's okay when you walk back up. How do you figure? How do you handle it if uh, you end up with sort of down, going down the tree somewhere at the same level, um, two overrides to permit root login? Um, but the, there is no, there is the same level, but there is still a well-enforced order. In this case, uh, whatever backup client does would override whatever SSH server does. And this is, right. I don't think there is any other way to do it. And this actually gives you a nice, uh, um, nice control over the system because uh, I often um, tag a number of my nodes with test, which I then append to the list of classes. And that means that that actually overrides whatever I set in there, overrides everything else. And then later on, I can remove, remove that test class again and, uh, and resume normal work. Of course, I do all my testing in a testing environment, not a production environment. Never. That's a joke. More questions? Good. Then uh, thank you, Martin. Thank you very much.